Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for coming to my talk. Today I want to talk, well, my name is Sebastian, first of all. And today I want to talk about debugging because debugging is an extremely important subject. So we spend an enormous amount of time debugging as, as programmers, but there aren't so many talks about it. And my talk um, has a slightly different structure than the, the other pro debugging talk by Mike Shaw that you may have seen at CppCon. I will talk more about the general debugging strategy, starting from the bug report you get. What should you do? And I will focus less on the individual tools. I will mention them, but I won't go into detail or on GDB, for example. So what is a bug? in the first place. What are we looking for here? Well, your program, any program, has some kind of specification that is usually more or less implicit. That is, you have maybe some things written down, but a large part of your program specification will be implicit in your head, maybe in all the heads of your team members. And only in very rare circumstances do we actually get a full specification that we write down. Now, your program has a bug, of course, if its behavior does not conform to that specification. And the bug report you're getting describes a symptom of that bug, not the bug itself. We have to go and hunt for that. Now, bug reports can take many different forms. This is a bug report that I received. Um, and you can see from the, from the date of that email, I received that email 14 years ago, and I remember that to that day, because it's not a very good bug report. Of course, it is, it is very short on details and I find the attitude is a bit off. So there are way better ways to get bug reports. How do you typically notice that there is a bug in your program? Well, maybe your application crashes. That's clearly not intended. Maybe you get a core dump when the application crashes and that's something you can analyze. Maybe your application just shares an error message or writes an error to a log file or shows any other kind of observable misbehavior. Maybe, for example, the performance is not what you wanted to do. That's also a kind of bug. So how many of those would you notice? And specifically, how many of those would you notice when they occur on a client's computer, for example? So the first step before we actually can start debugging is to increase the number of bug reports we get. This is the first step we have to do to, well, get better, more stable software. We want to have as many bug reports as we can. Okay. Now, what ways do we have to get bug reports? Well, we program in C++, so we have a type checking compiler. So the first kind of bug report are compiler errors, of course. They tell us that something is wrong with our code before we have to run it. That's a great feature, annoying as it may be sometimes. We can help the compiler a bit by writing static asserts that at, start, at compile times, things we want, uh, well, invariants, we want our program to hold. And we can also avoid bugs uh, and, so to speak, get, uh, get bug reports at compile time by moving some computations to compile time, by using consx pre evaluated functions, for example. I let you think for a second, what kind of bug can we avoid completely when we calculate things at compile time using consexpr expressions. Well, maybe you've seen the talk two years ago, we can avoid undefined behavior. And there have been talks about exploiting that fact. So everything that is consexpr evaluated by definition cannot show undefined behavior. Now at build time or shortly after build time, you can have unit tests, uh, any other automated testing uh, you can, you should have QA engineers that systematically test your software. And these all create bug reports as well for you. And then there's a large amount of bug reports we get by trying out our software. So we get them at runtime when somebody, we, the testers or our users use our software for the first time. And in order to get the largest amount of bug reports we can get, we should implement very strict error checking. This is what we do at ThingCell, for example. I think it's generally a good approach. So we here, we check all return values from all system APIs that we call, and we report them all to our backend. So that means 
when we make a call, for example, to an open file OS function. Then it's always um, expected that you cannot open the file because it doesn't exist anymore or opening the file fails because you don't have access rights to them. So these two bugs, these two error values are expected and you should always handle them. It would be very unexpected, however, if open file suddenly returned error out of paper. That's nothing you should handle. It will probably not occur. But if it ever occurs, I really, really want to know. And so we report all the unexpected error codes to our backend. We also write a lot of certs to assert preconditions and post conditions. And these asserts stay in release builds as well. And we report them as well to our backend. But they typically don't show up as error messages to the user because we want developers to write a lot of asserts. And if customers call because they see an error message, then developers would write less of them. So they are typically invisible and only we see them in our bug analysis software. So what we try to do is we try to enforce invariance uh, in a lot of places. We want to know early when our program leaves a path of defined behavior, the path that we have reasoned about. And when something extraordinary happens, then, then we want to know. So this was the one second summary of uh, a talk, a practical approach to error handling by our CTO Arno that he's given at a lot of conferences. If you're curious about how we do error handling, then I recommend that talk. So this is how our um, backend looks like. This is how our bug database looks like. So um, we can at a glance see what bugs have occurred most frequently on what operating systems have they occurred, in which versions of our software have they occurred. We can filter them in all kinds of ways. And this is not a one-way communication. This is a two-way communication. So when our software encounters a bug, for example, and assert, let's say, it calls our backend and says, hey, I have this bug here with that I know, message and that stack. And we can enter information in the bug database telling our system, hey, I fixed that bug in that release of our software. This information gets reported back to the process that encountered that bug. And that process might silently download the update that has fixed this issue and even update silently. And the user will never see that problem again. So that's a very, very powerful system. And you can imagine it finds a lot of, system, a lot of bugs that depend on the user's setup. So on the user's machine, environment, uh, other installed software, et cetera. So things that we could never reproduce in-house. Okay, so now we've maximized the number of bug reports. Now let's say somebody calls a customer or just a colleague calls you over into his office and says, hey, I have this error message open here. Uh, you have worked on this, do you wanna take a short look? So what can we learn from that single occurrence? We don't know anything else. Uh, we haven't analyzed it. We don't know if we can reproduce this. We don't know how frequent that bug is. We don't know anything. And I think it's a very good if you have a process in place in your company, especially, where you can still do that, where you can still call upon colleagues and ask them to look at a problem on your machine. So there's this famous quote by Gordon Edwin that said, um, who said, one in a million is always next Tuesday. And what he meant was that computers had become so fast that even the rarest bug that would only have a chance of occurring of maybe one in a million would probably occur by next Tuesday. And here we have the same situation. We have maybe a large piece of software that gets run a million times. So when a colleague calls you and has a problem, it might be your rare chance to look at a problem you have never seen before and you won't see again for quite some time because it's it is hard to reproduce. And sometimes just taking a short look can be worth it. You can be sure that if you have a successful software product that is used by, let's say, a million users, even the rarest bug will happen a thousand times per week once you roll that out. So when somebody calls you, look at it, and at least maybe if you can't fix it, you can form a hypothesis on the cause of that problem Maybe you can improve your error reporting somewhat and, and get an error message sooner the next time. So we come to the first practical example. So I've looked at bugs. I've looked at not my best code. I looked at the 
easiest to explain bugs that I have made uh, to show them as little interactive quizzes, so to speak. So here's the first one. Uh, we have a little system where processes write temporary data. They could write it to temporary files, but then we would create a lot of temporary files and we wanted to avoid that because all the temporary data is written once, but read many times. So we write all the data in a single temporary file. A process can read one of those temporary segments and it can append a new segment to the end of that file. Processes can also say that they don't need data anymore, then it's at first only marked as being deleted. And then later when somebody comes along and wants to append new data to the end, we compact the entire temporary data structure. Now what happened is that after a while, one of the processes suddenly said, I'm trying to read the segment, but I cannot read it anymore. Its data is corrupted. It's not in the data format I, I wrote, I expect. So something had gone wrong. And I didn't know what, I couldn't reproduce it. It only happened on a single machine occasionally. So I could only take a look at the code and reason for a moment about what I had written. So there are three operations on this temporary data structure. There's an append that takes a vector of bytes takes an exclusive lock on the temporary file, compacts the shared temporary file if necessary, and then appends the new data to the end. There's a read operation, of course, that takes the handle and an output buffer, then takes a shared lock and copies the data out. And then there's also a delete operation that takes a shared lock and then marks that segment as being deleted. Now, this is what I had. Something here is wrong. And it's probably obvious because there's not much on those slides that it must be one of those locking statements. But why is, are they wrong? And what are, how are they wrong specifically? So I told you that several processes try to access this temporary data at the same time. Now here I'm taking locks on a file, actual file locks. Is that a good synchronization mechanism for inter-process uh, synchronization? Yes, it is. That's why I've written it that way. But file locks are not a good synchronization mechanism for multi-threaded access. So when a single process here had several threads, then this algorithm would fail because each thread would own that lock. Well, the lock is owned by the process. So the append method could run concurrently for several threads of the same process. This was, of course, not intended and clearly a bug. And well, I fixed that by looking at that single occurrence, essentially. Usually we're not that lucky. Usually there's not much we can do just by looking at code. Usually we have to start this longer debugging process that I want to talk about. So that's an iterative process where you get a bug report, you think about it for a little bit, you form an hypothesis on the cause of those bugs or that bug. You test it in your code base. You maybe try to implement a fix, see if that fixes the problem. And you're probably wrong on the first try. And you have to take several iterations until you find the actual best fix for the problem you're seeing. And it's important to do that right and not to do it as fast as possible because you really want to find the best possible fix and not just cover up some, some issue until it pops up again. And the first thing that we need when we want to repeatedly analyze a problem and look at it again and again and again is a good reproduction. We want to have clear instructions with which we can reliably reproduce the same behavior and the same bug. And, but reproducibility is not a binary thing. A bug is not either reproducible or not reproducible. There are different shades of gray here. So there's the gold standard that a bug is always reproducible in debug builds while you're in an interactive debugger and that works on any machine. You're good to go to the next step. Most of the time, we're not quite so lucky. Maybe it is not reproducible in a debugger. Maybe it's only sometimes reproducible, but you don't know why yet. Or at the bottom of this ladder here, maybe it's only sometimes reproducible and only in release, that means in optimized builds, and only on very specific machines. And that's not a good situation. How should you analyze or make hypotheses and test them on the cause of that bug? 
if you cannot reliably produce that bug. So we want to move up here. We want to make hard to reproduce issues easier to reproduce. And there are a couple of issues, a couple of, um, a couple of techniques that can help us to do so. So let's say a bug is only sometimes reproducible. There's a set of extremely valuable tools, namely the three sanitizers, the address sanitizer, the threat sanitizer, and the undefined behavior sanitizer, that make it much more reliable to reproduce hard to detect issues. So at the, um, considering the address sanitizer, the address sanitizer will instrument your source code, will instrument your binary, and will instrument all the memory allocations, all the stack allocations and deallocations to reliably detect when you access memory that does not belong to a valid, alive object anymore. So unfortunately, in C++, it is very easy to produce code where you access a variable that has gone out of scope already. So the variable has been destroyed, but you are still holding a reference to it or a pointer, and you still access it. So I won't show you that code, but it is easy, and most of you have probably managed to write such code before. And so have I. And very often that will still work because the variable has been, the object has been destructed, but the memory is still unchanged. So accessing it works as if the object still existed, unless something in your program changes and suddenly that memory has been overridden and you crash. So the address sanitizer will make such, will detect such an issue in practically all cases and it will even tell you where you allocated that object and where you would try to access it. So it's very useful. If a problem is only sometimes reproducible, well, it could be something like a timing issue maybe. Maybe you have a problem with multiple threads, multiple processes, and the situation has to be just right for the problem to appear. And unfortunately, when you're trying to debug an issue using interactive debuggers, that issue, the bug report, the bug you're looking for, may disappear entirely because now in the debugger, the code is running too slow and you destroy the timing. Instead, you could do something else. Sometimes you can write stress tests um, for the relevant part of your code. So you execute it much more frequently, much harder than you usually do to force an issue uh, to appear. Maybe if you cannot use an interactive debugger without destroying uh, some specific timing, maybe you can still write to a log file get some information about the state and the behavior of your system that way without destroying the time. Last but not least, you can always try to write code that detects a bug and in that moment tries to print out more information of the, about the state of your system. Now, if a bug is only reproducible in some machines, on the other hand, then it's a good assumption that this has something to do with those specific machines, with their environment their operating system version, their CPUs, the version of your software, the version of other software packages that are installed. So you should collect all the data about the environment that you can, anything that could interfere with your program. In that regard, desktop environments are clearly the worst. There are virus scanners blocking files. There are system tools that uh, can hook system functions. System management tools can disable some services, parts of your software. User system administrators can misconfigure the user uh, rights. And there are digital rights management software that are also very invasive. Maybe you can reproduce the exact environment in a virtual machine. Maybe that is very complicated. Maybe you can really only reproduce it on a client machine. But maybe you can have the client ship such a machine to your office. We have done that in the, in the past, uh, and not only once, actually. So this is, this, is, this is possible and sometimes the only solution. And here it is important not to focus too early on one's possible cause of a problem. Maybe the problem is only reproducible in some machines, but maybe it's still a timing issue. Maybe these machines are very slow. Maybe they're very fast. Maybe they're very busy. So it's important that early, while we're still looking for reproduction, to keep an open mind and um, not to make too many assumptions and always think, well, it could be something else entirely as well. So if everything else fails and you're not getting a better reproduction, 
then hopefully you have a good automatic error reporting system. So Google CrashPad, for example, is an open source solution to get that. Uh, you can also hook into the operating system provided error reporting very often. Sometimes you can write and ship analysis code that tries to understand an issue better and uses the error reporting to send more information uh, your way. Maybe by getting a larger amount of reports for the same issue, you find clients, you find environments that are easier to reproduce than others. If you have really outstanding error reporting, you can even try out fixes and on the customer side and have your code report back if that worked. Although I have to warn you, we did this exactly once in 20 years. Typically, we don't. Sometimes all you can do is look at the program state after the problem occurred. You can't reproduce it, but maybe your problem, your program produces some uh, output uh, that indicates maybe what has gone wrong. And that leads us to our second little quiz. So here we had a customer report to us that starting our software failed. And according to the log file, this failed with a bad alloc exception. Now we could go to our error reporting system and we could check that apparently loading our initial settings file already failed. We didn't have a reproduction, but we could, now that we knew this, we could go to the customer and ask him for his settings file and just take a look at it. And we saw that it contained some bogus data in a number formatted string. So instead of a single string, it contained the same string repeated two to the power of 18 times. And that was clearly too much. Now we had the assumption, well, maybe something doubled our format string 18 times, though we didn't quite understand how that would be possible. So we looked at the data structure first. Where's that thing stored? It's stored in a vector, and there's a vector, which is a pair of a size t and a format. So that size t is an index into a string, and then you have a format string that says, insert this number format in this location. This vector, that's important to know, is stored in shared memory, which is shared between different processes. Now we went one step deeper. How is the vector size calculated? Well, the vector size is n minus the begin pointer divided by the size of the elements. Okay, and maybe that's already ringing a bell for, for some of you. So what's the size of those elements? And specifically in shared memory, is that the same for all participating processes? Specifically, how big is the uh, size t? And is that the same for all processes? And of course, it is not. It is not the same size for 32-bit and 64-bit process. So that was the problem here. Yeah, those two shared shared mem access to the shared memory by design, but then you have to make sure that the, all data structures in that shared memory segment are the same size for all the processes. Now we could fix that bug here by replacing std size t with uh, std int 32 or something. And because I've mentioned static asserts earlier to generate better bug reports at compile time, of course, the real fix also involved writing a static assert that asserted that all data structures in shared memory have a specific constant size. Okay, I see there is somebody in the Q&A. Um, with respect to automatic, James asked, with respect to automatic error reporting, do you have suggestions for library SDK vendors? Um, since we're not building the final executable, I worry we would break trust if we try to include something like that. We, we, don't, we, don't, implement, um, we don't implement the actual executable hours either, uh, but, we still Im but we still ship our, our own error reporting. And we let customers disable error reporting. We have business customers, uh, and we, sometimes we can uh, tell them as much as we want that we don't send actual sensitive data. Some of them just want to disable that, and um, that's okay. But we, we include our own uh, our reporting library. And un, 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 uh, except for uh, the, the Google one, I'm unfortunately not, not aware of, of any other ones because we haven't really um, looked into them. Okay, now we have a good reproduction. We can look at the, the problem again and again. Now we actually have to find what the problem in our code base really is. 
So we have to identify the actual bug. Because, uh, here, yes. because, well, the symptoms we're seeing, the error message, the crash, probably isn't where the bug is. The bug might have happened earlier or somewhere else entirely in our code, and we are just seeing a consequence of it. So we have to go back and, and, and think about how we ended up in that state we are seeing. So how do we find the real problem? And again, use all the sanitizers. I've already mentioned them. That's one way of finding the real problem in a lot of cases. And the other solution is use interactive debuggers. They are extremely powerful, and I'll show you some ways how to use them effectively. So when you're looking for a problem in a large code base, maybe in a code base you're not very familiar with, Sometimes it's, it's a good first idea to, to get a better understanding of the system, of its components, how they behave, how they interact. And we can do that by, by tracing information. So maybe we want to understand what functions are being called, in what order, with what arguments. So that's where people used to do the good old printf debugging, or maybe now we should stay a stit format debugging. So you would just write printf statements somewhere and trace out uh, this function was called with those arguments. The downside is that this requires recompilation, of course. So it's not a very flexible approach. What is better is to use tracing breakpoints that are supported by GDB, LLDB, and Visual Studio. So a tracing breakpoint is a breakpoint in the debugger where the debugger will not interrupt the execution but instead you can tell it to print out information to the debugger standard output. And that information can be very flexible. It can be the function name, it can be the number of times that breakpoint has been hit already, it can be variables even. And that doesn't require recompilation, of course. And even better, you can add those tracing breakpoints to functions where you cannot insert printf, for example. So you can, in, you can add the tracing breakpoint to did F open, let's say, to operating system functions, uh, even to binary code if you want to. So, for example, you could add a tracing breakpoint to std F open that would print out the first argument, the file name that is being opened, and run your application and see all the files that it opens when it's starting. And GDB and LDB are very powerful here. You can add arbitrary debugger commands to those breakpoints. For example, you can also print a stack trace when that breakpoint is hit. So you cannot only print that f open is being called to open this and that file, you could also print the entire stack trace and find out who opens that file. GDB and LDB even have Python APIs, so you can execute Python code when a breakpoint is hit, and they have debugger APIs, so you can do useful things in that Python call, evaluate other variables, evaluate the memory automatically. It's extremely powerful. But here, a warning again, tracing with tracing breakpoints as well may make timing dependent bugs disappear again because your program will execute slower, of course. Sometimes you suspect that the problem you're looking for is specifically in the interaction of your program with the operating system. In those cases, it's often not necessary that you add tracing breakpoints to all the operating system functions you call because your operating system probably comes with good logging tools already that you could use. So in Windows, there's Process Monitor, for example. There is D-Trace on macOS, and there is a diverse set of tracing tools on Linux. And Process Monitor, for example, can trace um, accesses to files, accesses to the Windows registry, um, and things like that automatically for you. And you can just look at the Process Monitor trace and find out, for example, why some component doesn't find uh, something in the registry, let's say. And here, of course, if you're trying to debug your operating system program interaction, it is extremely important that you know your operating system very well, that you know the semantics of your operating system's primitive, primitives, that you know how file logs work on your operating system, that you know how shared memory and virtual memory work, the file system, the IO system, et cetera. So this takes a lot of experience or a lot of reading. So here's where experience really, really um, comes, comes, comes into play a lot. There's just a lot to read on operating systems. 
Sometimes you're lucky and you know that you have a bug, let's say in your latest, latest version of your software, but you know that bug wasn't there two weeks ago. So you have a buggy version and you have a good version of your program and you can compare the two. The best case is, because I assume you have uh, reliable source control systems like Git in place, you can binary search the list of your commits and find out which commit introduced the bug you're seeing. There's, for example, git bisect to do that binary search for you. Now, the advantage when you find that breaking change that introduced the bug that you're seeing now is that you can look at what that commit tried to achieve. Maybe that commit was trying to fix another bug. And now you can look at both problems simultaneously and figure out a solution to both problems at the same time. If you don't do that, you run the risk that by fixing your new bug, you will reintroduce the old one again. And that's something you want to avoid if you want to make progress. Sometimes if you have those two versions, the good one and the bad one, you can just go through them in parallel in the debugger, step through them in parallel and see where the behavior differs if that is not obvious from looking at the code. You can also sometimes take the bad one uh, and do something like the opposite and just start disabling code until the problem disappears. This can also help if you have a bug where it's absolutely not obvious in the code how that could happen. So you disable a large part of your code base, comment it out, the bug is gone. And now in a binary search way, you disable increasingly smaller portions of your software until you find the place that triggers this behavior. So that of course requires recompilation. It also requires some knowledge of your code base. And it can be, as all debugging, can be very time consuming if you have a complicated problem that is hard to know in advance. And then there's a very good debugging technique and that debugging technique is improve the code you have in front of you. Maybe that code is hard to understand because nobody bothered to write asserts and to document the invariants that should hold. So you can do those. So check them in. Maybe you find out that those asserts you think should hold actually trigger and you notice that the bug does not con that the program you're looking at here does not clearly not conform to its specification and maybe you can find a slew of other bugs that way if you have to write very complex checks to figure out something then it's okay to do them just temporarily without checking them in maybe the code you have in front of you is legacy code maybe it's worth to introduce safer programming techniques if it uses a lot of raw pointers, introduce smart pointers. Maybe that way you don't only fix the bug you are investigating, maybe you fix a few other ones that you haven't even found yet. And then there's a couple of tools which are super interesting and they try to do well exactly what we're trying to do here. They are reverse debugging tools which also exist at the very least for Windows and Linux I don't think uh, there's one for macOS yet. So they record a trace of your program's execution until you encounter that bug. And then they let you walk backwards in time. So they let you step backwards, uh, which is exactly what we want to do. We want to go backwards until we find the problem, the cause of the bug behavior in our code base. And I've already mentioned them a lot of times. You have to know your debugger itself. Um, you have to watch a talk on your debugger, possibly, because I'm pretty sure there was one uh, at CppCon or another conference. Do we already use data breakpoints or sometimes called watch points that tell the debugger that you want to uh, break execu interrupt execution when a specific piece of data is read or written? Do you use debugger scripts to save uh, frequently used uh, functionality in your debuggers? Do you write debug visualizers for your own data types so you see them in the interactive debuggers? Do you have passive assembly skills when you're debugging? Unfortunately, these can be extremely useful. So here's a problem, for example, where I unfortunately needed passive assembly skills. Um, so I have this little function, get item from indices. I don't have the source code for that function. But what it does is it takes a number of integers, indices to objects, and then it should return a container containing pointers to those objects. 
So I pass in four such indices and I expect to get four objects back. In fact, I only get two back, which is clearly the bug. So what did I do? Well, I set a data breakpoint. I tell LDB in that case, please set a breakpoint when the first element of my integer array is read. Uh, so when there is a four byte a read access to that array. So you can set data breakpoints when data is read, not only when it's written. Now what LDB does its thing, and predictably I find some code that reads my array. That code looks a bit like this. So there is uh, an access to my array, somebody takes a pointer to it, then there is some kind of loop with a loop variable, and in that loop, uh, my array is accessed. Now, unfortunately, I don't find this. I find this. So this is ARM disassembly, and we all have to do more ARM programming now that ARM computers have become so popular, but I'm not so familiar with it yet. So I translated this uh, for me and also for you. So the first line gets the pointer P that is stored in X8. Uh, the second line gets the loop variable V, which is stored in X10. And then the last line accesses my array. And it takes V in X10, left shifts it by three, and then uses that as an index into my array. Left shifting V by three bits is equivalent to a multiplication by eight. So that, that is weird because my integer array, each integer is only four bytes long. Why does it use the loop variable and multiply it with eight? So that's clearly the bug. And it's also explains why I get exactly half the elements back because it's skipping half of my elements. And now I knew the history of that piece of software I was interfacing with. And I knew that it was ported from Windows to macOS in that case. So that gave me a pretty clear idea on what had gone wrong. And I could write a pretty good bug report to somebody else in that case. Because on Windows, longs and ints are actually the same size. So some people use long and int interchangeably a bit. On macOS, a long is eight bytes long. And an integer is four bytes, of course. So probably somebody had taken a long pointer instead of an int pointer on the Windows code and then just compiled that for macOS. And I could send a bug report to the programmer with, with that piece of binary code. And that bug got fixed, I think. So we have seen the first part of that process. We have increased the number of bug reports we get. Let me quickly take the question. Ah, can you expand on writing data visualizers for your data types? Uh, what does this workflow look like at a high level? That depends very much on your uh, debugger. So for Visual Studio, there are XML files, which are called NatVis. Um, and you can, you, can, you can Google them. They have a clearly defined uh, format where you can write, we have a set of allowed expressions and you can write well to show a nice representation of my data structure, follow these pointers, for example, and, and, and then print the result and debugger. And for LLDB, you have to implement Python code. And for GDB, I'm not sure what you have to do. So um, for Visual Studio, I think you can write NetWiz files and check them in with your solution. And Visual Studio will find them. That's an extremely nice workflow. I think for LLDB, at the least, you have to, um, I think you can also deploy LLDB initialization settings files that will be read by LLDB each time it is started and they can live in your user folder, for example. And you can tell, you can give LDB commands in that initialization files. You can use them to create your own custom LDB environment and say, hey, please install these five uh, data visualizers and I want to have this command line command that I've written myself that executes this Python code. So uh, that unfortunately depends uh, on, on each debugger. So we've seen the bug reporting, the, the, the debugging process. We've uh, received bug reports. We have increased the amount of bug reports we're getting. Uh, we try to find out what goes wrong in our system and analyze the system. And we have seen some tools that we can use to make this easier debuggers, sanitizers, reverse debuggers, 
OS operating system facilities that can help us get log files. Uh, we have to get to know the operating system. We have to learn a bit of disassembly on the while we're at it. But there's one crucial technique without which debugging will not work ever. And that is you have to be able to question your own assumptions. You are sitting in front of a program that is clearly wrong. So you have made a mistake if you like it or not. And you have made assumptions while programming naturally. And at least one of them, probably more, but at least one of them are wrong. And you have to go back and question all of the assumptions you have made, at least all of them which are relevant to that bug report. And if you are unable to do that, and I have had seen people who have a challenge, who are like have difficulties questioning themselves, then you will just never find that bug. It is as simple as that. Okay, now we've identified the bug. Now we can spend some more time on well, fixing it properly and, and preventing the bug from, from appearing again, hopefully. And the first step to do so is to classify it. What kind of bug are we looking at here? And I would classify them like loosely in two categories. Uh, it's not very scientific. It's a loose categorization. The first one is a small bug. You didn't quite write what you meant to write. So maybe you forgot to initialize some data. Maybe you didn't use the best programming techniques, you have a memory management problem, you use an out of scope temporary, or you overwrote some data by accident, or you got your locks wrong, like I did. So often in those cases, the fix can be a local change, you clean that up and use some better programming practices maybe, and then your program works again. Still, you can always check the rest of your code base, have I done the same mistake? somewhere else? Should I clean this up somewhere else? In that sense, it's not such a small fix maybe. But then there's the big problem. You have a big bug. If you wrote what you meant, but you meant the wrong thing, that means your entire mental model was wrong. You, you didn't think about the problem correctly. In, well, you didn't capture the problem correctly, let's say. Uh, you need a new mental model and a local fix here and there won't fix the problem. Maybe you didn't understand the specification of somebody else's code or of your operating system primitives. You used the entire the wrong APIs, internal or externally. You used operating system facilities that don't work like you thought they did. Again, see my log example. Uh, you need to rethink your approach here. Or maybe you didn't understand your problem, your input set uh, correctly. You maybe didn't, as a consequence, maybe you didn't use the correct algorithm at all. Maybe your problem is way more complex than you initially thought, and you, you have to rethink your implementation completely. And now, unfortunately, those two cases aren't very easy, aren't easy to tell apart. That depends very much on, well, the code in front of you. Let's take a look at this completely made up example here. Let's say we have this function that does supposedly something interesting, and it gets a vector of unique pointers. We iterate over them using a for each, and then we dereference them. And now, predictably, somebody tells us, well, this crashes here. One of those vectors is null. Now, we could do this. That will, that will fix the crash for sure. But is that the right solution or the wrong solution? Well, that's hard to tell from, from that piece of made up code. Uh, what were you trying to achieve? What were the invariants your program was supposed to, to, to guarantee? Was the input guaranteed, supposed to be guaranteed free of null pointers? Then that's probably not a good fix, but you should fix the cost. So that requires, again, to look at your problem, think about your problem, think about the invariants that were meant to hold, and then figure out where the best place uh, is to, to fix the bug. And that's that's... That's difficult. There's no other way to put it. So, like I said, look at the bigger picture. What were you trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve it in the correct way? Uh, do you actually understand your input sets, your variant invariants correctly? And well, rethink, rethink what you were trying to do. Okay, and now we've classified the bug. 
uh, we think we know if we need to make a, well, if a bigger problem or a smaller problem. Now we have to finish this up and actually fix it. And there are there will be people who tell you that as a general practice, it's a good idea to write the smallest possible fix that, that solves the problem. It solves the problem and it has the advantage that it has the smallest chance of introducing any new bugs because it is a small change. And I think as a general guideline, this is, this is not a very good guideline because it leads you to implement two small fixes. Um, and there are several problems that can occur here. Maybe by thinking about the smallest possible fix to your problem, you end up writing a fix that doesn't actually cause the fix the root of the problem. Maybe it only hides one specific instance of the problem that you've just seen and the problem is actually still there. And even if that is not so, by writing a sequence of small fixes, you run the chance of reducing your code quality and making your code harder to understand. So instead, I would advise to do the opposite. Think first about the ideal solution in an ideal world if you don't have any time and money constraints. Given everything you know now after having debugged this issue, uh, how would you solve the problem if you could start from the beginning? And then you should somehow try to move towards this solution. And now you live in the real world, of course. You have real constraints. The second question should be, Okay, given the constraints I have, what can I change now? Do I need to ship a fix quickly because I have customers waiting for it? Or because I work in a secure environment where making bigger changes is extremely difficult? Then it's completely okay to find that small fix, put it into the stable branch and ship it fast. But you can still take the time in your development branch that won't ship for, I don't know, another year, another two years maybe, to move towards the ideal solution in that branch. And then ask yourself, why did that bug happen in the first place? Was it hard to program correctly and too easy to program incorrectly? What was there missing for you? Was there a library feature missing, uh, an algorithm? Was there a standard programming practice missing in like your company guidelines maybe? And can you prevent that bug from ever happening again? Can you make that fix everywhere in your code base, for example, introducing smart pointers everywhere. Uh, can you look through your code base for that pattern in the first place? Can you introduce that abstraction that was missing that you tried to implement and then you made a mistake doing so? Those missing abstractions can be different things. So here, another example uh, from our code base, we had this a code like this and astonishing amount of times in our, in our code base where you would have some container, you want to sort it first, and then you want to get, after having sorted, the range of unique elements in that container. And so you do a sort, then unique range, but notice that the sort and the unique take two different predicates that have to be implemented in a compatible way. Now we have this pattern 74 times in our code base implemented by hand each time. And of course, some cases that was wrong. Somebody made a mistake in the predicates and it wasn't correct. So we implemented that li library function for ourselves that, that fixes that problem once and for all. A missing abstraction can also be related to error reporting, for example. I already said that we try to um, report and check all error codes. So this is how this can look, for example. We make an open call, we try to open a file, and there are three cases that we have to handle. Uh, if open returns a non-negative value, then that's a file handle, and the open has been successful. If it returns minus one, the invalid file handle, and the global error variable is set to e-interrupt, then we want to retry the open. And then there's a very limited set of errors that are actually allowed. We don't have permissions to open the file, or the file doesn't exist. For anything else, I want to have an error report in our backend. And um, well, then I figure out what to do. Okay, and with that, we are practically, practically done. And I'm also practically done with my talk. So the last two slides are things you hopefully all do already. 
So if you fix it, yes, you have to document it some way. Specifically, if you're writing a bug fix, that in the code obviously, well, wasn't obvious. Otherwise, you would have thought about it. Can you reference bug your bug tracker in the code? Can you clearly document um, why that bug fix was needed and when it can still be when it can be removed again? That's often a very useful information. Not so much why did I put it in, but when can I throw it out again? Uh, do code reviews, of course, to like question each other because that is often easier than questioning ourselves. Uh, have version control, otherwise finding that breaking change will be pretty hard. And yes, write tests because that's one way of generating bug reports. Uh, well, right from the beginning. And here, the only advice is that. Test cases have to be well, well written as well, just like our code. And if you have trivial test cases, you don't learn that much. But if you can test, for example, random input and verify them uh, that test against the trivial implementation, then you can have very good, a very good test, test, tests. That's the word. Um, okay, and that that ends my talk, and uh, that has covered the entire debugging process from the beginning, so to speak. To the end, we have uh, fixed our bugs, and I thank you for your attention. Um, we are recruiting, of course. Uh, you can send us an email, and I am open to more questions, either here or in Gather Town.